morning and welcome to the Heart for Iran webinar today. Uh, topic is a great one. When Faith is Forbidden with Todd Nettleton from Voice of the Martyrs. I just want to say welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, on Facebook, all of our social media, um, on YouTube, and here live in the webinar. I know we have 63 people here in the actual webinar link today with us. So if you're in the webinar, thank you for doing that. And we definitely want to uh, get your questions throughout the topic as we start to talk about it. And as questions come in, we'll cut your questions and give you a chance to interact with our guests today. But this is a great day. We're excited for the upcoming uh, Memorial Day weekend. But before that weekend comes, we are going to talk to you about persecution and the persecuted church. So thanks again for joining us. And as always, uh, my name is David with Heart for Iran. We're a partnership of more than 100 ministries working to reach the nation of Iran. And my co-host is Dr. Mike Ansari here with me today. Uh, welcome, Mike. It's great to have you. Thank you so much, David. It's a pleasure to be with you guys again. Guys, we've been talking about persecution quite a bit um, within the last year and so that uh, we have had webinars joining you guys. Now, why are we having webinars? If you have a passion to see the Great Commission accomplished across the world, then this webinar is for you because we're focusing on, on uh, not, uh, not just the world, but focusing and zoning in on Iran, the country of about 82 million. Uh, that uh, used to be once a free land where people used to practice uh, religion and, and different ideas freely. No longer free now. Uh, but what is going on is, uh, is uh, the community, David, the community of Christians are usually divided into two segments. Some that believe that persecution was a thing of the past or if it is happening, let's just move on and not talk about it, not worry about it. And then there's a community that says persecution is happening and we need to talk about it and we need to pray for those people. So this webinar is for both of those groups because persecution is taking place. It is happening and we cannot turn our back to it. Even in the going back to the New Testament, we realized that Paul himself wrote about persecution happening in early days and, and the apostles were being persecuted. And since then, there has been ongoing persecution against Christians throughout the history. And for those people who may believe that persecution is not happening nowadays, I actually have news for you. You, all you have to do is to go, go to Google and research. You'll find out that uh, 37 Christian were massacred in Plateau State in Nigeria just a few days ago. You'll realize the house of Christians in Pakistan was burnt just a short time ago. You realize in Iran, Christians that um, uh, that were once Muslim now Christians are being systematic, uh, systematically harassed and prisoned and uh, uh, even kicked out of their country. Persecution is happening all around us and we could no longer be quiet about it and be silent about it. Uh, the vision here is not to sensationalize things. The vision is for us to have an intelligent conversation and understand what is going on and what is our responsibility. That is why today we are overjoyed to be able to have one of our dear friends, one of our ministry partners from Voice of the Martyrs join us. And that is my brother, Todd Nettleton. Todd Nettleton just recently wrote an amazing book, which my colleague uh, Chris is going to uh, introduce to you. But Todd happens to be one of those very unique individuals, Americans, who has been involved in, in the forefront of uh, where per Christians are being persecuted. And he has managed to write an amazing book, which will be introduced throughout this program, and we're going to talk to him. So without any further ado, allow me to uh, welcome Todd and introduce Todd to you. Todd Nettleton, thank you so much for joining us. Todd is the Chief of Media Relations and Message Integration for the Voice of the Martyrs in USA. And he's also the host of the Voice of the Martyrs Radio. It's a very popular radio station. They also are in form of podcast in various uh, podcast stores. Make sure you listen to them. He serves as a voice of the voice for the persecuted Christians. That's important. He serves as the voice for persecuted Christians, inspiring Christians with faithfulness of Christ's followers in 70 plus nations where they face persecu persecution for wearing Jesus's name. During more than 20 years serving at VOM, Todd has traveled to, world, to the world and uh, conducted face-to-face -face interviews with hundreds of Christians who have endured persecution in more than 30 nations. 
He's a graduate of Bartersville Wesleyan College, which is now known as Oklahoma Wesleyan University, and has done his postgraduate study in the University of Oklahoma. Todd and his wife, Charlotte, have two sons and two daughters, daughters-in-law. Daughters-in-law. <laughs> in his spare time, he enjoys reading music, reading music, travel, and, and sports, including serving as a commissioner of a fantasy football league. I have no idea how he finds the time to do all these things because I know how busy he is. Uh, so he is, he is a man of many talents, but he's a dear partner of Heart for Iran and a true friend of the persecuted Christians. Todd, it's a pleasure to have you today on a live uh, Heart for Iran webinar. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Mike. Thank you, David, for having me. It's, uh, it's interesting. I was thinking the last time I was with you, it was during the middle of lockdown. Uh, and I did it from my guest room slash work at home office. And today I get to do it from my real office. So uh, it's it's great to be back with you again. Well, it's wonderful to have you here. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce your book right now to everybody. If you guys are seeing this book, this book is called When, Faithful, uh, when Faith is Forbidden, 40 Days on the Front Lines with Persecuted Christians. It's a publication um, by... Um, uh, Voice of the Martyrs, uh, and uh, we are so excited to have Todd, who's the author of this new book, with us. This book, you guys can go ahead and uh, purchase it at bookstores and on Amazon. Please go ahead and do so if you have not. So let's go ahead and get it started real fast. Uh, you have been involved in ministry that speaks on behalf of persecuted Christians. We love that. You've been doing that for many years. Can you just tell our audience uh, how you got started doing this work? Well, you know, people ask me, how did you come to work at Voice of the Martyrs? The, the day that I point to is the day when I was 12 years old. Uh, my parents and my family, we packed up and moved from our wonderful home in Southern California uh, to spend four years in Papua New Guinea, where my parents served as missionaries there. Uh, and that really, there's a lot of seeds that that experience planted in my life uh, that are producing fruit now and have produced fruit in my years of service at Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, the, the gift of travel, uh, the, the excitement that I feel when I get on a plane and go someplace I've never been before, uh, that started when I was 12 years old and we moved to Papua New Guinea. Uh, the gift of sitting down with someone from a different culture and having the attitude of, I really want to hear from this person. I, I want to learn about their culture. I want, to, I want to learn a few words of their language so that I can say hello, so that I can ask where the bathroom is so that I can kind of enter into a little bit of fellowship with them. All of those seeds sort of started to be planted during that time that we served in Papua New Guinea. And so, uh, like I say, I really, I point back to when I was 12, even though I obviously didn't work at VOM when I was 12, but that really started a lot of patterns in my life. And I, I really honor my parents for making that decision and for taking our family in that direction. Um, and so when I came to work at VOM, they, the person who hired me uh, is married to my college roommate, and she was given the task of building a communications department here at VOM. And uh, they basically came to me and said, hey, we need someone who likes to tell stories to tell stories about persecuted Christians. And I uh, had a background in journalism. I was a sports writer for a time. Uh, I love telling stories. Uh, and I, I really honor persecuted Christians. I really hold them in high esteem. So what, what better stories could I tell uh, than the stories of people who were so uh, passionate about serving the Lord that even if you beat them, they would continue to serve the Lord. Even if you locked them in prison, they would continue to serve the Lord. Even if you put a gun to their head, they would continue to serve the Lord. What better stories could somebody tell than the stories of those kind of bold, faithful witnesses for Christ? Uh, and now I've been doing that for 23 years and uh, doing it through Voice of the Martyrs magazine, doing it through the radio program, uh, and now very excited to do it through this book. That's fantastic. And Todd, you guys do it so well. We are just really happy to be partners with Voice of Martyrs in so many ways, but also just to sit back and see the work that you guys are doing. You know, Iran is just one of many nations where persecution is happening. And uh, we're just thankful for your ministry and what you guys are doing. You know, as Mike was doing the introduction, he mentioned, you know, there's some people that think that persecution doesn't happen anymore. I'm always shocked by that. You know, I appreciate you bringing that up, Mike, but 
I'm always shocked by that when I am in part of a conversation and the persecution comes up and someone will say, oh, yeah, persecution that happened in the Bible back in the Roman times and different things like that when the church was persecuted. And I just am shocked that there's people that still think that way. So, I mean, I want to ask you, what is what do you guys consider? How do you define persecution and what reaction are you seeing to your book initially as people are are seeing the reality that persecution is happening uh every day you know i i have a pretty simple definition of persecution persecution is when you're forced to pay a price for what you believe by the actions or by the decisions of someone else and so you know that there's obviously within that a wide range of sort of what you might call levels uh, in some places we would say somebody got mocked for their faith well was that persecution yeah because they paid a price they had to deal with that mockery but that's obviously a lot less than somebody was killed for their faith so there are levels of persecution but i think it basically just boils down to that person had to pay a price because they held firm to their faith. They held firm to Jesus Christ. Um, and so it, it is interesting. And as you said, you know, a lot of Christians, and, and it, it's unfortunate, a lot of Christians, they read the book of Acts, and then they finish, and they turn on to Romans, and they think, well, you know, that, that was persecution. It's over now. Um, if you're paying attention, it is not over. And we in America are, are very blessed uh, but maybe a little bit spoiled by the the idea that, hey, we come to Christ and it for most of us, it never dawns on us. I'm going to have to pay a price for following Jesus. It's just like, of course, I can come to Christ. That's my decision. I'm, I'm an American. I'm a Christian. I want to be a Christian. I can do whatever I want. Our brothers and sisters around the world, oftentimes from the day they accept Christ, they know this is going to cost me something. Right. You know, my family's going to turn against me. If anybody finds out about this, I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to get kicked out of my apartment. Um, so it's a very different experience for them than the one most Americans have. But but we need to understand what it means to follow Christ. The other thing that we need to understand is how much the Bible talks about persecution. And, you know, when you face trials of many kinds, it doesn't say if you face trials. It says when you're going to face trials. But God has a plan for that. Jesus told us what to do in response to those situations. So I, I hope that this book helps build that understanding of what is reality for our brothers and sisters around the world in places like Iran. For those of you guys who have joined us, um, uh, we are with our brother, uh, Todd Nettleton from Voice of the Martyrs, who is the author of uh, the book, When Faith is Forbidden. And um, we are live, and uh, if you have joined us through either Facebook or YouTube, um, you, we would love to hear your questions. Uh, please, uh, in the chat section, uh, put your questions. We'll be sure to ask the questions in the one hour of webinar time that we have with our, with our friend Todd. Todd, let's talk about the reality of persecution. So it's one thing to read it in the Bible. It's another thing to hear on the news that, you know, um, some, some individual or some tribes or some people across the ocean on some remote areas of the world are being persecuted. The reality of persecution never hits us in the West because we may not be really, be really going through the motions of that. So the next question that I have for you, you know, in your book, um, you have captured, uh, you know, many countries, the stories of many countries. You have traveled around the world gather the stories you know, about persecuted Christians for more than 20 years. And uh, why, in your opinion, is it important for believers to understand the reality of persecution, for us in the West to understand the reality of persecution? Why? You know, I, I would point to two reasons. One is because the Bible tells us to. You know, Hebrews 13, 3 says, remember those in bonds or remember the prisoners as if you were in prison with them. Well, if you don't have any idea what's going on, you, there is no way you can follow that scriptural mandate. I mean, if you're completely disconnected, uh, the scripture talks about when one part of the body suffers, we're all supposed to feel that. Well, how can we possibly feel that if we don't even know what's happening, if we don't even know what's going on? So 
I think there very clearly is a scriptural mandate for us to be connected with the rest of the body of Christ and for us to know when parts of the body of Christ are suffering. But the other reason I think is, is maybe more of a selfish reason. If, if there's a possibility that we as American Christians are going to encounter hardship, are going to encounter persecution, what better way could we prepare for that other than the scriptures themselves, what better way could we prepare than by sort of scouting the people who have already gone through it? You know, what did they do? How did they get through it? How did they come through it with victory, with a smile on their face, instead of being destroyed by it? Because, you know, as you read some of the persecution, it would be completely understandable if, as you read the story to say, wow, that destroyed that person. That person just was totally broken by this experience. And yet, time after time, we see Christians who weren't broken. And in fact, they got stronger through the time of persecution. So if we think there's a possibility that, that we or our children or our grandchildren are going to face persecution for our faith, what, what could we do to prepare more than study the scripture and study the stories of those who've already been there? Wow, Todd, I tell you, as you know, you've been doing this for years and you've been studying people and getting to know them. I just am kind of amazed personally, the few times I've had the chance to just be face to face with someone uh, that's gone through persecution and to hear their story and just kind of uh, relate on a one to one level is kind of is life changing. And you can read. I know you can read about it, but when you are there doing it and you've been doing this for 20 years, so I just want to think you've been interviewing people that have maybe just been shot. They've just been traumatized. They just got out of jail. I mean, it's that fresh. Uh, what is it like to kind of get a, a an, uh, time to be with them, get an interview with them, sit down with them? How does that feel? And what, what are some of the big takeaways of sitting down with a person that's fresh out of persecution? You know, I, I really think of it as a holy privilege to get to have those conversations. I, like, I, I'm not, I don't know why God picked me to do this, but I'm really thankful that he did because uh, it really is a holy privilege. And uh, you talk about fresh. One of the stories that I tell in the book is the story of meeting an Iraqi pastor uh, eight days after people had tried to sh kill him. Uh, assassins had come after him. They had shot up his car. They actually shot him. And he was still he showed us in the front of his coat, there was a bullet hole. He, he stuck his finger through the hole and he was still wearing the coat that he had been wearing when he was shot. And I was just like, you know, for one thing, why are you still wearing that coat? And for another thing, if, if there's a bullet hole right in the front of your coat, how are you still walking around? That That wow. is just, you know, mind blowing to me. I think one of the amazing things that happens is, the sense of joy and the sense of privilege that they often have. I remember, you know, early on in my time at Voice of the Martyrs, we went to see a pastor in China who had been arrested like 12 times in the three months before I was there. And in my mind, I had this picture that, you know, here's this pastor, he's been arrested all these times. He's probably going to be pretty discouraged and depressed and and isn't it great that, that our team could come from America and we're going to cheer up this pastor because he's just been through this really hard time. And so that's the picture I had in my mind, like that he, you know, he's going to be really sad and we're going to kind of pat him on the back and say, Hey, keep going. And, and we got there and he wasn't sad at all. He, he was the furthest thing from depressed. He was excited, you know, Hey, my church is growing. We're having this really effective ministry. Wow. And sure, the government's mad about that. And yeah, they've locked me in prison several times. But look at how fast the church is growing. Look at how many people are coming to Christ. He was just excited. He, you know, and, and that was such a lesson for me and such a sort of a mind shift. Like they don't need us to come and cheer them up. They love to share how faithful God has been. They love to share their stories. They love to fellowship with us. They don't need us to cheer them up. They're excited about what God is doing. And, you know, as the Bible talks about, the, the apostles were taken before the Sanhedrin and they were beaten and released. And the book of Acts, I think it's chapter five, says they left the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. 
Now, most of us, if you said, hey, I'm going to beat you, and then I want you to have a spirit of rejoicing after that, we would say, uh, no, I don't, you know, I don't want to rejoice in that. Um, but that's the spirit that the apostles had, and it's the spirit that comes through in so many of these stories. God has honored me by allowing me to suffer for his name's sake. This is a compliment that God has given me. And that is such a such a foreign concept for me and, and for many American Christians that, wait a minute, you feel good about being persecuted? You feel like God honored you by doing that? But it comes through again and again in the book of Acts and in the stories of persecuted Christians around the world today. Todd, um, the key word that comes to my mind when I listen to you is the word perseverance. Um, last week, a, a friend of mine reached out to me and told me about a, a Somali believer who, as he was walking towards his home, a big pot of hot oil was poured over his head. I actually saw a picture of this uh, brother of ours. Uh, he was, uh, when he went to hospital, they asked him, they said, are you Muslim before they started treating him? But um, let, me, let me tell you that I saw a picture of him and later on there, there was this joy in him. And you, you talk, you're touching on the fact that they, they don't want our pity, but there is, as, as these people go through uh, persecution, they persevere and there's this holy joy. Now, in your book, again, I, I, I do want to talk about the book a lot because, guys, I just want you to support Voice of the Martyrs and Todd and read these stories. You have captured 40 stories. When you went through these stories, uh, did you notice some common things that uh, they helped them persevere? You know, I think there there's a couple of common themes that come through, and one of them is joy. We we talked about the fact that they really they really do have a spirit of joyfulness, a spirit of excitement about what God is doing. The other common theme that that I think comes through again and again is they counted the cost ahead of time. They made the decision: I'm going to follow Christ. I know this is going to be costly. I know there's going to be people angry about this. I know my family might turn against me, I, but I'm still going to follow Jesus Christ. And that sense of counting the cost and understanding this is going to be costly, I think that really is a difference maker when the trial comes. Because if you've already made the decision, yes, this is going to cost me a lot, and yes, whatever the price is, I'm going to pay it, when that trial comes, when that moment of decision or, or moment of threat comes, you don't have to make the decision in that sort of intense moment. You've already made the decision. You just have to act on the decision that you've already made. And so I think that willingness to count the cost ahead of time and to prepare for persecution, to prepare mentally, to prepare spiritually, to prepare with an understanding of the scripture and even memorizing the scripture so that if they take away your paper Bible, you still have a Bible. You have the Bible that's in your heart. You have the Bible that's in your head. Those are decisions and actions that are taken ahead of time before the persecution actually starts. But that's the thing that really allows for victory in that moment and allows for uh, your overcoming faith to come through instead of the, the doubt and the, man, am I sure I want to pay this price? Am I sure I'm willing to do this? If you've already made that decision, then you don't have to make it in the moment of persecution. I think that's an important truth, not only for the people in this book, I think that's an important truth for all of us as well. Wow, Todd, this is good. And I think one thing you mentioned is the privilege of being able to interact with these people. And you know, we go thinking like, hey, we can help them, they're in trouble. But then we wind up getting more out of it than they do. Uh, you know, they're, they're blessing us and they're bringing to us. And I think that's the benefit of this book that you put out. You're getting these stories in the hands of, uh, you know, American Christians, average, average people here in the West. that We don't see this day to day. And now we're able to kind of get into that mindset and it's going to bless uh, the church here. It's such a powerful thing. I really appreciate it. If you are just joining us here on the webinar, this is the Heart Free Ron live monthly webinar that we do. We're here with Todd Nettleton and we're streaming live. If you have questions for Todd, please put them in the uh, webinar box. Or if you're watching this on social media, 
we want to ask you to do that now. And we'll start to ask those questions to Todd and give him a chance to uh, interact. Todd, um, one of the people has already posted a question. They want to know, how does a person find joy in persecution? We've talked about this a little bit, but I mean, are there any specific takeaways? How did they find that joy? You know, I, I think the key to that is the presence of Christ. Uh, the, the presence of Christ in that moment. Uh, I think of a Sudanese pastor that I had the chance to interview named Pastor Hassan. He was in prison in Sudan, actually imprisoned along with my coworker, Peter Yasek, uh, in Sudan. And as he was telling me the story, he said, you know, many nights in prison, he, he wasn't, didn't have a bed. And so he ended up sleeping on the floor of his prison cell. And he said, I would just lay on the floor. And in the middle of the night, I would just be weeping. And me, naturally, I said, oh, I, yes, I can certainly understand that because it was so uncomfortable, uh, because you missed your family, because you didn't know when you'd get out of prison. I, I can totally understand why you were weeping. And he said, no, 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 no. <laughs> he said, I was weeping because the presence of Christ was so mm. real in that prison cell. He was so close to me. He was right there with me. And the only response that I could have in that moment was just to weep tears of joy at the presence of Christ with me in that cell. So I think, I think that's the key. And there, there are stories, there's others in the book about people who just experienced Jesus in a prison cell. And I remember Hussein from Iran actually talked about in a prison cell in Iran he said, this is the quote, and I think I'll always remember it. He said, it was like Jesus put the whole world aside and just came to that prison cell to hang out with me. Wow. Like, like we were just going to spend some time together in that cell. His, his voice was so real. He was so close. Mm. I think that's the key. I, I think the joy just comes because Jesus is there. And as we understand, hey, yes, this is a difficult time, but Jesus is right here with me then that joy just sort of bubbles up out of us because of his presence. Wow. Um, so people who have joined us again, uh, we're talking about persecution. It's a, it's a very real topic. Um, it's, it's a theological discussion as well, the theology of persecution. Um, we don't have time to go into the topic of theology of persecution, maybe another time. Uh, but uh, what we wanted to share here with you guys is that it is happening all around us. Now, um, Todd, I've had people in America come to us and say, you know, I have lived my entire life in my family and we were, were, we were never really were persecuted as Christians in America. Um, but we want to understand what is the best way for us to get along and stand next to people who are persecuted. Now, one of the things that you have done is, um, you know, you have, you're allowing people with your book to go through, let's say, 40 day journey. On, on hearing the, uh, the stories of the persecuted Christians. Um, I feel that what you're doing is, a, is, a, is an awesome thing because you're telling people that have not had first-hand experience of persecution to walk with you, next, with, next to you, experiencing 40 days, uh, 40 days of journey with persecuted people through this book. Tell us why you're doing that and tell us how people can actually experience. What is it that you're trying to do with this 40 day of journey <laughs> that you're asking the audience to walk with you and experience this story? Can you explain that to us? Well, so many times when I come back from a trip, uh, I will talk about the people I met on the trip. Uh, you know, I'll talk about it in my Sunday school class or I'll talk about it with my Bible study group or I'll do a radio interview and I'll talk about it. And someone will make the statement man, I wish I could go with you. <laughs> I wish I could go meet that person. I wish I could go and sit down. And that, that thought really is sort of the genesis of the book is like, hey, I can't buy you a plane ticket. And in some places they wouldn't want, you know, a large group anyway. Only one person can get in because it's just not safe. But how about this? How about if you spend 40 days through the pages of this book and, and we do go on a trip together and that's that's really the genesis of the book. And as you read the book, it, it is 40 stories from persecuted Christians. But I've also included some tidbits from my own journals that, that I keep on trips. And, you know, some of those are 
what you might think of as, as high-minded and spiritual about, man, I just was blown away by the faith of this person. Uh, some of them are, are much more maybe low-minded uh, about, you know, the trains or the airports or, or the bathrooms or, or whatever else. Um, but I want the person who reads the book to come out on day 41. One, I want them to be inspired by the faith of the people that we've met on the trip. And, and I don't think you can spend 40 days hearing the stories of persecuted Christians and then just wake up on day 41 as if nothing has happened. I, I think yeah. you will be challenged. You will be different. Man. But I also want them to feel like, hey, we went on a trip together. You know, when you go on a trip with someone, you have conversations and you get to know them and you get to know about their family and, and you experience those things together. I hope the reader has a little bit of a sense of that too, that, hey, yeah, I went on a trip with Todd Nettleton and, and this is what we experienced. There was some amazing people we met. There was also some sort of fun, frustrating stuff along the way and we got to experience it together. Wow, Todd, I wanna go, I mean, I hope this isn't going off topic of, of your book. These are exciting stories. They're faith building stories. They really build us up. But as you're talking, I just have a question that maybe uh, you can help me answer. You know, I we've also encountered people that have gone through persecution. We hear a lot of the same type of stories, very faith building, very positive. Through your journeys over these years, have you seen the other side? I mean, there is a reality that some people don't make it through persecution or some people are, are it's just too much and they might turn away. Um, these aren't necessarily the stories that you're talking about in your book, but have you come across those kind of stories as well? And what are the realities out there of the, of the, um, the brutal facts of persecution, how people that don't make it through the other side? You know, there are those people and I typically, that's not who I'm interviewing because right, I've, right. I've gone to meet the person who was victorious and did come out the other side. Right. But over the years we have had, I, I have had some encounter. I'll, I'll never forget meeting a, a young Christian woman in Pakistan who had been raped uh, by a Muslim as a part of, you know, she was a Christian. She was basically a low caste. She was worthless. And so he could do whatever he wanted. And her eyes were dead. I mean, it, it just, it, there was so much pain and, and just frustration and agony in, on her face. Uh, and her mom was with her. And I just thought, you know, as a mom, how, what do you say? What do you do to your daughter who's just been raped because she's a Christian, because your family is a Christian family? Um, and so I have had some of those experiences. The other thing that has come through in, in some of the conversations is the challenge to forgive. Mm. And, and I think maybe that's one of the keys of, of coming through to that victory. And, you know, for some people, and I've had conversations with people who just supernaturally, God gave them the ability to forgive. It wasn't something they had to work for. It wasn't, you know, they didn't have to kind of pray through to get to that. God just said, you know what, this is over. I'm allowing, you're going to forgive these people. And, and they did. And, they, and it was great. There's other conversations I've had where people say, man, I, I'm still, I'm trying to get there. You know, I know I'm supposed to forgive this person, but Hey, let, let me tell you what they did to me. How do I forgive that? How do I work? Or yeah, I forgave them. But then the next morning I woke up and I realized I was still mad. <laughs> I, you know, yeah. I, I hadn't completely forgiven them. And I think, so there is definitely, there are those who are wounded deeply by persecution. And, and like I say, typically that's not who I'm sitting down with. Uh, our international ministry staff is, is there before me and they're there after I'm gone, helping and working and ministering to those people. Um, but it certainly is important for us to remember there are those people. We need to pray for them. We need to fellowship and, and enter into their space of suffering as well, just like we do those who are already at the point of victory and are saying, you know, praise the Lord, he was with me through this. Yeah, I think in uh, the reason I asked that question, it's almost like when we're talking to uh, the West, they, they either don't know there's persecution or once they do know, they almost 
assume it's a foregone conclusion that that person is going to be come out on the other side and angels are going to be there and there's going to be, you know, halos and all this stuff. That's not always the case. And when you meet the people face to face, you do hear those stories of agony and it it makes it even more real. And so I, I wanted to ask you that question and and just get some of that reality. I hope our audience can, can sense it. And as they take the journey through the book, um, just really be there with the person and don't assume, you know, everything uh, is going to be easy for them. I mean, it's hard. And, and that's one of the things I've talked to people that have been through persecution. I'm uh, amazed at like how difficult and, and the, the really the brutality sometimes of persecution and how people can be threatening uh, their family members or people that aren't there. So it's not just their threat, but it's the threat of, um, you know, people they know that, you know, they could attack my family. They could do things like that. So it's not just this, let, okay, it's going to be one cookie cutter way. Let me add one more, one more part of the answer to that question, okay. if I can. And, and it comes from uh, the writings of Richard Wormbrand, who was the founder of the voice of the martyrs spent 14 years in prison and he writes about the fellow prisoners he saw that literally went insane. They were driven insane by the suffering and by uh, the persecution and the hardship of it. And, and he writes, Richard Wormbrand writes, that he believes that their insanity was beautiful in God's eyes because they had literally, they had lost, their, they had given their mind for the cause of Christ. Wow. Uh, and so that that was Richard's interpretation of that. And interestingly, uh, Pastor Brunson, who was in prison in Turkey, Andrew Brunson, while he was in prison, he was concerned that he was losing his mind. Mm. And he read Richard Wormbrand's books while he was a prisoner himself and was encouraged by Richard's take on, on that topic. So it's interesting how the legacy of persecution is handed down from generation to generation. But but that was Richard's take on it was, yes, there were people who literally were driven insane by the persecution. And God thought that was beautiful that they had made that sacrifice. So let's talk about Iran. Um, obviously, Works of the Martyrs has a heart for Iran as well. That's, that, that makes us uh, have such a good DNA of working with each other. Uh, for some of the viewers that may not know, Iran, um, according to Open Doors International, is the eighth most dangerous place to be a follower of Jesus. There is a very good chance that in your neighborhood in America, you may have uh, an Iranian family or an Arab family uh, live in, that, in your neighborhood that has escaped because of persecution. Uh, connecting with these people is very important. That's a different topic. That's a different uh, webinar, hopefully. But uh, the question that I want to ask uh, Brother Todd is, tell us a story about Iman, the Iranian, who said his time was uh, of persecution was the sweetest time in his life. Uh, what is his story and why does, uh, why does he pers uh, you know, describe persecution in those terms? And we just wanted to touch on a story in Iran, from Iran. Go ahead and share that with us, please. Well. You know, as I was preparing to talk with you guys today, I was looking, there's actually seven days of the 40 are with Iranian Christians. So as you read through this 40 day journey, we're going to spend seven of those days with Iranians and two of those days are with Iman. And uh, Iman had an amazing story. And one of the only times this has ever happened before, you know, we said, hey, Iman, we want to hear your story. He said, before I tell you my story, I want to pray. And we said, okay, you know, that's great. And, and what he prayed was, Lord, I don't, I don't even want to think about what I was before Christ. Mm -hmm. So as I'm telling this story, don't, don't let there be even a crack in the door where Satan could get more influence with me. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was his prayer before he started to share his story. And I thought, what a, what a great prayer. What, what a great way to pray. Lord, I don't, I don't want Satan even thinking about that old stuff. I don't want to give Satan an entry point in my life. The other thing he said as he started to tell his story, now he said, I, I want you to understand, I'm a very competitive person. And I was like, okay, yeah, that, you know, that's nice. And he said, no, no, I, I'm really a competitive person. He said, <laughs> you know, when I was in the Iranian military during the Iran-Iraq war, I told my commander, you send me to the place where I can be martyred for my country within 24 hours. 
I, if it's not the worst fighting, I don't even want to go there. And he said, when I was a thief, I wanted to steal more than anyone else had stolen. And if someone else tried to steal something and failed, I wanted to go and steal that thing just to show that I was a better thief than they were. Wow. <laughs> and he said, when I was a drug addict, I wanted to use more drugs than anyone else was using. And I wanted to use every drug that anyone was using. So even as a drug addict, I was very competitive. And I'm like, okay, Iman, I understand you're very competitive. But here's what has happened. He came out of drug addiction and was miraculously rescued by Christ and literally had the experience of, of Christ being in the room with him. And he said, as he told the story, he said, I knew Jesus was in the room with me, but I didn't want to open my eyes because I was so unworthy. Mm. I wasn't worthy to look at Jesus. So I just kept my eyes closed, but I knew, I knew he was there. I knew he was in that room. And sorry, this story always gets me wound up. <laughs> um, he, that competitive nature suddenly was turned in an absolutely radically new direction. He didn't want to be an average disciple of Christ. He wanted to be the absolute best disciple that he could possibly be. He didn't want to be sort of tell some people about Jesus. If he was going to be an evangelist, he was going to be the best evangelist that Jesus has had. He was going to tell every single person that he ever talked to about Jesus Christ. And his attitude was, why would Jesus bring someone into my pathway today if they weren't ready to hear about Christ? Because I'm committed to tell every single person I talk to about Jesus. So, his, I mean, if he met somebody at the store, they must be ready to hear the gospel. If he got arrested, it must mean that a policeman was ready to hear the gospel. Or one of his fellow prisoners was ready to hear the gospel. And the part of his story that really amazed me is he actually, you know, as you guys know very well, if you're going to share Christ inside Iran, pretty soon you're going to have an encounter with the cops. You're going to get arrested. You're going to spend some time in a police station. And Iman was sent to jail. And at first he was put in solitary confinement. And then he was put in a cell with a hundred other prisoners. Uh, and he spent about three weeks in this cell. And during that three weeks, he shared the gospel with every single one of those 100 other cellmates and 24 of them bent the knee bowed their heads and prayed wow. to renounce their old life and receive christ and receive forgiveness and wow. after a month uh, iman had some contacts they pulled some strings he got out of jail and he sent in his monthly ministry report that month to his his ministry leaders and he said well hey uh, in the last 30 days, I shared Christ with 100 people. 24 of them prayed with me to receive Christ. And he didn't, it, it was several weeks later that they figured out he had been in jail during that month. <laughs> and they called, they called him up and said, Iman, you know, why didn't you say in your report that you were in jail, that you got arrested and, and all this stuff happened? And he said, well, you know, it doesn't really matter where I was. I, I put all the important stuff in the report. I shared Christ with a hundred people and 24 of them prayed to receive Christ with me. That's the important part that of course, that's the part I put in my report where that happened is completely irrelevant. The important stuff is I shared Christ with a hundred people and 24 people prayed to receive Christ. So that is the spirit of Iman. And, and I think, you know, there's so many lessons for me. There's so many lessons for us in that story in, in seeing every person we meet as somebody that, that God has literally brought intentionally into our path so that they can hear the gospel. How many of us go through our day that way? How, right. how many of us think that way? And so I love the story of Iman. It, every single time it makes you emotional to think about it. And I just think about what an amazing privilege to have got to sit down with him and now hopefully to share his story with with thousands of readers through this book wow that's that is an incredible story and it is interesting how um this prison experience that so many of our brothers and sisters around the world have gone through is like a formational time and you realize like so many of the people that are assuming leadership in the emerging church and people that are leading in the underground church in iran have had this experience They've been through uh, prison. They've experienced that. I remember 
a couple of years ago, we were in Turkey and uh, we met with some uh, people that had been out of prison. They escaped Iran and now they were in Turkey. And one of the people with us asked them, you know, where do you guys want to go here? Do you want to go to the West? Are you trying to escape? And, um, you know, what's next for you? And uh, it, it was interesting to me because for the first time I saw a shift. Those believers wanted to go back to Iran. For years, we saw in the movement that people that came out of Iran, they wanted to get as far away as possible. And now we're starting to see people that have had this experience are ready to go back. And I don't know what that indicates as far as a timeline for Iran or what's happening, but we are seeing that the people are not wanting to run from this. They're wanting to uh, work within it. And we're seeing the church grow like never before. Um, one of the viewers has just asked the question. They want to know how can we in the West prepare for persecution as Christ draws closer? You know, I, I, I think two ways. I think one is the scripture. We have to be people who are driving deep roots into the scripture. We have to be studying. We have to be memorizing. We have to be reading every single day and letting the scripture wash over us and transform us. The second way, I think, is the stories of people who've been there. Um, you know, when, when a football coach is preparing his team for the next game, they watch the plays that worked against that team before. And they say, okay, well, yeah, we're going to do this because, look, it worked on this play. That's what we're doing as we share the stories in this book, as we, you know, read the Voice of the Martyrs magazine, as we listen to Voice of the Martyrs radio. Every time we read a story of a persecuted Christian, I think the natural response is, what would I do? You know, if they put the gun to my head, what would I say? If they arrested me, what would I do? And the great thing about that question is then we need to go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I know what the right answer is. I know what I want to say I would do. Help me to be strong. Help me to be able to genuinely say that's what I would do. Uh, give me the strength to go through that. So I think the Bible and the stories of those who've already been there, those are our two main tools to prepare ourselves if the day is going to come when we face persecution ourselves. Todd, um, I want to go back to the story of Iman. And um, so let's say 24 people are coming to Christ. We know that Iran has one of the fastest growing churches in the world. Would you say that when in a setting like Iran, it's, it's a closed country, it's a persecuted country, when the Christianity grows, does persecution also grow as well? Is would you say persecution would be on rise in Iran? Um, is that the trend that you see in, in Iran or is that a global trend? Can you just speak towards that? You know, I think it's certainly a global trend uh, and that is you know, that's bad news. There's more persecution, but it's also good news because there's more Christians. <laughs> there, there are more Christians who could potentially be persecuted. And so there is more persecution. So that's, that's a sort of good news, bad news situation. The interesting thing that I have heard about Iran is uh, much of the persecution is primarily from the government uh, because right. there is such a, a discontent with Islam uh, it is unlikely that your family members are worried about you becoming a, if they, you know, the attitude that I have heard from Iranian Christians is the family's like, well, Hey, if that works for you, great, go for it. It's not a, wait a minute, you know, we're a Muslim family. You can't be a Christian. The persecution that's coming is coming from the government and, and they are very concerned because the church is growing and wait a minute, this is an Islamic Republic. We're all Muslims here. How can we allow this church to continue to grow? And so I think that's one thing that is maybe a little bit different and a little bit unique about Iran is primarily it is the government less than the culture at large because so much of the culture has rejected Islam. They, they don't believe that Islam works. They don't believe that Islam has the answers. Uh, and so it's not the sort of taboo subject to say, hey, I'm following Jesus, uh, except the government gets very upset. Right, right. Todd, we've got a question um, from one of the viewers. They want to know about the church in Canada. So I think this is a great time to kind of ask, 
Do you think that what's happening in Canada is persecution? Is this a sign of things happening that's going to come in the West? You know, I'm I'm not an expert on Canada, so I will I don't I want to put that little disclaimer up there up front. Uh, we do have a sister office, Voice of the Martyrs, in Canada, and I think I think Canada is ahead of the U.S. as far as the rise of secularism and the rise of uh, sort of a distrust of religion and and oh, religion makes you a fanatic, and so we got to stand against fanaticism, uh, and so I think. What we're seeing in Canada, maybe the U.S. is a few years behind that. Um, but I think for my Canadian friends and for my American friends, we need to prepare ourselves as if persecution is coming soon. You know, my attitude is if I'm prepared for persecution and it starts tomorrow, well, then I was prepared. If I'm prepared for persecution and it starts 20 years from now, well, I was prepared. Uh, it doesn't matter when it's going to start. It matters that we are preparing ourselves and that we're getting ready for that. And I think, you know, that I would encourage my Canadian friends with that word. And I would encourage my American friends and my friends from other nations as well. We need to prepare as if persecution is coming soon. Um, Todd, a recent study in Iran showed that uh, Iran as you mentioned, is Islam is bankrupt. Iran is going towards secularization very fast. Now, last week, there was another study done in US that said the majority of the millennials um, don't care much about faith. Um, and to them, God is not a topic of interest. What we're seeing is uh, the church in, in America, in the West, and also the church in the Middle East is not talking about more of a feel good conversation on their Sunday services, just to attract people. And that causes uh, you know, conversations about persecution to be less important. Mm. Now, why would that be a danger? Why would, that, uh, why would that be a challenge if the church in the West and then eventually the church in the Middle East and around the globe, because they wanna be attractive to, to gain more members will let go of talking about persecution and other things. Can't you just share your thoughts on that? Question. You know, <laughs> for one thing, it, it gets, on that one, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> for one thing, it gets us away from the scripture. Uh, I mean, the scripture says you will be persecuted. Jesus said the world hates me. And if you follow me, the world is going to hate you, too. So, so that's one problem with that is if we get away from the understanding that it's going to be costly, we are away from what the scripture says. But the second thing I, I think is if, if going to your church is the same as going to the park on Sunday or going to the mosque or going anywhere else, why would I want to come to your church? If your church, if, if you don't have anything to offer that is different than everyone else, then I'm just going to do what I'm doing now. I don't need to change. But if, if Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life, and that's the only way that I get to heaven, then I need to pay attention to you. So I think as we, as we back away from scriptural truths, we become less relevant to the world, not more relevant. So you're challenging the church leaders in America and outside to not forget about biblical truth of persecution you basically are putting a challenge out there right i am challenging people and, and i think that's the challenge that christ gave us that's the challenge that the apostle paul wrote about that's what peter wrote about in his letters you are going to be hated and it is very hard for us as americans to hear that because we're used to being comfortable we're used to sort of the Judeo-Christian background of our nation and, and having Christian values accepted in the culture, if, if not even supported somewhat in the culture. I think those days are going away and we need to understand we're going to be counterculture. The culture is not going to support us. It's, we're not going to be able to sort of float along and go in a scriptural direction. We're, if we float along, we're going to go away from the scripture. We need to choose to swim upstream. We need to choose to be counterculture. But, you know, that, that there is an attractive quality to that, especially among young people who see the culture and see 
the commercialism and they see some of the frustrating things about American culture and they say, wow, I want something different from this. We have something different. We have a God who asked us to sacrifice, who said, follow me no matter what it costs. That can be a very attractive message, but we need to we need to not be afraid to tell the truth to people. Yeah, that's good. Todd, Voice of Martyrs is a great ministry. We love you guys. As we close up this uh, webinar, I just want to give people an opportunity to get to know you better. How can they reach out to you? How can they find out more about the book, uh, When Faith is Forbidden? We definitely want to encourage everyone to get a copy of this. Uh, what are the websites and the addresses uh, for people to reach out to you? The book website is whenfaithisforbidden.com. There is a, a video trailer there. There's also a connection to get a copy from Voice of the Martyrs as well as other retailers. So whenfaithisforbidden.com. The other two websites that I would point people to, one is the main Voice of the Martyrs website, which is persecution.com. The other is Voice of the Martyrs Radio, vomradio.net. Uh, we have links there where you can find a local radio station that's carrying the program. We also have links to all the different podcast apps. Um, so persecution.com and vomradio.net. That's fantastic. As we're finishing this up, Todd, what are some key ways that uh, people can support the persecuted church? When you want to get leave something with our viewers, what are some things they can do walking away from this as next steps? You know, I always tell people a three-step process, and the first step is pray, and that's not my idea. That's the idea of persecuted Christians. The first thing they ask us to do is pray for them, uh, and, and so step number one is just make a commitment that you're going to pray regularly for persecuted Christians in Iran, uh, in other nations as well, and then I think step number two is educate yourself so that you can pray more effectively. So it's not just God bless persecuted Christians, but it's God bless Pastor Wang Yi, who's serving a nine-year prison sentence in China right now. And so number one, pray. Number two, educate yourself so that you can pray more effectively. And obviously, this book is a resource to help you do that. The Voice of the Martyrs Radio is a resource. The Voice of the Martyrs Magazine. There's lots of resources to help you educate yourself. So number one, pray. Number two, educate yourself so you can pray more effectively. And then I say number three is whatever God lays on your heart to do, okay. do it. Because as you're praying and as you're learning more, I think God's going to put his finger on something and say, hey, I want you to do this. And maybe this is send Bibles. Maybe this is get on an airplane and go to Iran and go on a prayer walk through the country. But as you're praying, as you're learning more, then God's going to say, okay, now do this. And then just be obedient to what God is laying on your heart to do. Hey Amen. That's great. Mike, what's your final thoughts on this? Yes. Um, uh, first of all, I want to say we have a lot of other questions that have come in. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we want to encourage all you guys to work with Voice of the Martyrs. Support them. Uh, they do an amazing job around the globe. And uh, some of the audience members asked if there are resources in Arabic. Yes, they have resources in many languages. Just connect with them on their, on their website. Uh, we want to empower and encourage all of you guys to look up Voice of the Martyrs, uh, join them, uh, again, support them. Uh, but I want to ask you, Todd, um, can you tell our, our audience why it is critical um, for ministry like Voice of the Martyrs to work with ministries like Hearts for Iran? We can't do what we do without partners. Uh, and, and, you know, the body of the Bible draws the picture of the body of Christ. We're all connected. We have different roles within that. Uh, I think that's very true for our ministry as well. We have partners, we have contacts, we have co-workers who are in some cases on the ground doing the work, in some cases helping us reach into a country like Heart for Iran, helps us reach into the country of Iran. And, you know, it also helps us not to duplicate each other's work. There's no reason to have 10 guys doing the same job if you could have two guys and the other eight could kind of cheer them on and support them and equip them to do that job better. Um, so we so appreciate Heart for Iran and the partnership that we have together. And uh, we love Iran. We love the country. We love the people there. And we want Jesus to be king in Iran. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you so much for that, Todd. And I just do want to say Voice of Martyrs is a great partner with Heart for Iran. And we really do appreciate uh, the ministry and what's happening. I hope, uh, viewer, I hope you were encouraged today by this message 
Um, I hope that you go out and get the book, When Faith is Forbidden. And I hope you read these stories, do the 40-day journey, and you're strengthened in your faith. I mean, ultimately, that's our journey. That's our goal. And we want to bring you in and allow you an opportunity to participate in the ministry and what's happening uh, in Iran, but not just Iran, all over the world where persecution is happening. And we hope that this has been a good time for you as a viewer. Chris, before we finish in the next 30 seconds, I do want to go ahead and invite our audience to join us next month, right? June 25th, same yes. time, we're going to talk about the gift of giving, the role of generosity for the emerging church. Our, our churches, we need to have generosity in the core values of our, of our church. Uh, so please make sure you join us at that time and tell your friends to join us. The links will be available and sent to you guys or sign up on our website, heartsforiran.com. Yeah, absolutely. You're not going to want to miss that one. Generosity is such an important aspect we see growing in the emerging church, and we're going to be talking about that uh, next month. So definitely join us for that. Final thought I want to let you guys know, um, we are launching a virtual Sunday school in Iran. So just as you've been watching uh, this virtually, and we see so many things are happening virtually, virtual and digital ministry is going up and is increasing like crazy for Iran. We've seen this happening over the last 16, 18 months. And so we're launching in response a virtual Sunday school. We're going to provide a link for you if you want to help participate in that, if you want to support and encourage underground believers uh, in Iran through a virtual Sunday school, then there's going to be a giving opportunity there. We don't want you to miss that. Well, guys, we've covered a lot. Again, Todd, thank you so much for being with us. It's been a real privilege. You are welcome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, God bless you, Todd. God bless Voice of the Martyrs. And thanks to all our viewers for being there. Please share this video with your friends. Let them know they can go back and watch it. Bring this to your local church. We want to get the message out that God is working in Iran and God is working in this underground movement all over the world. God bless you. And we hope you have a great day.